Guten Tag, meine Damen und Herren. Ich begrüße Sie alle. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you to the 9th Adenauer Conference on the role of Germany in international security policy. This year, tomorrow, we will deal with two focal topics. First of all, the experiences with the Afghanistan mission 20 years after 9-11. And on the other hand, with the perspectives of transatlantic cooperation after the administration change in the United States, I am happy that we can open today's conference, this traditional conference, with a keynote on the perspectives of the German foreign and security policy. Our keynote speaker is Armin Laschet, Minister President of the State of North Rhine-Westphalia and Chairman of CDU. We will then have a discussion moderated, facilitated by Anna Sauerbrei from the Tagesspiel newspaper. I would like to say sorry already because we have a limited amount of time and might not be able to answer all the questions you may have. Ladies and gentlemen, today is the birthday of Johann Gottlieb Fichte, who has been dead for a while, admittedly, and who was never minister president or a candidate for the chancellery. But nevertheless, he is one of the most famous representatives of German idealism. And he once said, I quote, any ghost disappears if you focus on it. And this may be the biggest difference between philosophy and politics. For philosophy, it may be a contribution to dealing with a problem to just identify or name a problem to deal with it. But to really deal with the problem, it is not enough. But rather, we need operative conclusions in order to deal with risks or specters or ghosts successfully and ban them and banish them. And we are now looking forward to hearing I mean, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Norbert Lammert, dear participants of the Adenauer Conference, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great honor for me to speak to you today. The Konrad Adenauer Foundation is a place of political analysis, of exchange. It is known worldwide for its engagement. And I think that is why it is the right place to lay out a few basic ideas on uh, foreign policy challenges for the coming years. The aim of German security policy, foreign policy, was always peace, wealth, freedom for people in Germany and Europe. And the preconditions for this have changed fundamentally. And for this change of an era, I would like to name five key points. The first um, sign for such a change, epochal change, the rise of China is just one facet. But this alone is sufficient to fundamentally change the international power structure. China is a competitor, is a partner, and our relations with China will play a significant role in our discussions. Secondly, we see new technologies that dominate and permeate our everyday lives. And we can see that technological progress does not just change everyone's lives, but also international politics. Computer chips, for example, can change from a mass product to a strategic resource. In Germany, we currently have a car manufacturer halting its production because certain chips are no longer available. Availability of resources will thus be an important element of foreign policy. Thirdly, we see a disrespect towards international um, law 
and we see breaches of it. Also, in Western democracies, we see populist streams that question basic principles that we always stood in for. And the man in the capital wearing that bull's head um, became the symbol of um, this new phenomenon. So we have autocrat states and we also see in our Western democracies the questioning of values that have carried us through the past 70 years. The coronavirus has caused a poly pandemic, as the Munich Security Conference called it, because apart from the mere health crisis, it is a global, sustainable, multi layer crisis that is uh, visible far beyond the health crisis. Corona undermines progress of development and especially the later phases of the COVID pandemic uh, mainly impacted those who are socially at a disadvantage worldwide. We can see the developments in India, for example, and everyone needs to know that we can all only be safe once we have globally managed to overcome this pandemic and walls and frontiers and isolation can no longer protect us, not against the pandemic. Fifth, our foreign policy approach is safeguarding freedom, chances of freedom. And the interesting thing is uh, the judgment that the Federal Constitutional Court passed on climate protection. It also applies to uh, politics. It was not just about protecting na natural resources, but also protecting the rights to freedom of future generations. And we, as today's generation, have to answer these questions. And therefore, the fight against climate change has already always been a global challenge. And it is more and more becoming part of a climate foreign policy that is also part of this epochal change that we see. And that, of course, asks a question, how should we position ourselves in Germany in order to actually create this change? Uh, first of all, we need to have the willingness to create international politics, that our internal debates aren't just about internal problems, but that we look at international politics and developments and discuss how they impact our lives and that we find solutions for them. We want our country to be a leader in technologies. We want our country to be more resilient against external shocks such as pan pandemics, cyber attacks, economic crises. We want to have a decade of modernization within our country in order to remain able to act worldwide. And for our foreign policy, this means, from my point of view, that we need to become more strategic. We mustn't just react to crises, but rather we have to act with a vision, with a long-term vision. And we need new methods of um, dealing with things, a changed security structure that has a visionary, that enables us to have a visionary st a strategic approach. Globalization makes challenges, military and civic challenge challenges melt, and the changes of inner and outer security also um, dissolve. Cyberspace is part of our societal life, but also the Achilles heel of um, security policy. And during a pandemic, we have seen that non-military situations can fundamentally threaten our lives. And therefore, we need an institutional cooperation of our state security uh, structure and co connecting structures is something that we also need to mirror in our administration. And we can only do this 
by further developing the Federal Security Council to a National Security Council, which should be positioned with the chancellery because in decisive moments, our country needs the expertise of the entire government, including intelligence services, and they all have to sit at one table. And if this affects questions of health, such as corona or inner security in the case of terrorist threats, then the lender also need to sit at the same table. So the current Federal Security Council is no longer enough. It needs to be a National Security Council that is cross level and cross sectoral and is able to analyze the strategic situation of the country. That is what I mean with interconnected security policy. We need to act um, uniformly because the answers are becoming more and more complex and our tools are becoming more and more multinational. So we need to act in a stringent matter with a vision. A National Security Council must draft strategic um, answers for climate, foreign policy, security policy, uh, foreign trade, global health policy, as well as European foreign policy. And one of the tasks of this um, National Council will be to set up a national security strategy that the entire federal government will agree upon and that the German Bundestag, the parliament, will discuss. Such a national security strategy should be drafted in the first year of the new legislature, and then in the third year it should be updated. And this should happen one again and again under parliamentary participation and enable a broad discussion. The next important topic is Europe. <clears throat> Europe has to be able to become a player on the global stage. And that means, first of all, that it needs to be united. Find joint positions on strategic issues. And secondly, if not everybody wants to be on board, it has to be possible for a core group to make progress. This is the very idea of the cooperation between Germany and France. Here we have two countries that have agreed to coordinate very closely in terms of their international activities. And this Franco-German engine has to be open to everyone who is also willing to do more than what is currently in the treaties. And of course, when we talk about security in Europe, we also need to talk about an important non-member of the EU, the UK. We need to redefine our relations with the UK, especially when it comes to security policy. Because after all, the UK is still a NATO member, member of the Transatlantic Alliance and a very important partner for Europe. And if, like the President of the Commission said, Europe wants to speak the language of power in order to project its weight in the world, then it needs the right tools to do that. This means that we need to continue our work on joint European projects to step up Europeans' military capabilities, do that together, so that we can rely on this structure that is ready for operation. We need an adjusted European security policy, which then needs to be supported by all of the governments and by all of the states. And people need to be willing to take joint decisions, also when it comes to military decisions or armament decisions or defense needs. That will be an important shared challenge. My next comment is about our position in the world. The new US president likes to talk about the like-minded democracies. This holds the opportunity that the partners on both sides of the Atlantic who share their values and their understanding of democracy and freedom can take action together in this world. This has been extremely difficult in recent years, and it will be one task to get together with like-minded democracies in the world. 
And actually, these are more states than just those that are part of the transatlantic alliance. Everybody who shares our image of what humanity means is a part of that group. Europe's position is right next to the United States, next to Canada, and we need to revive that partnership with new topics and with um, new momentum. This will also include questions of trade, a large free trade area, but also a joint climate foreign policy. The new climate commissioner, John Kerry, representing the US government, came to Berlin very recently. And when I spoke to him, I could sense how strong the momentum now is in the USA. They have their own special commissioner for this topic. He used to be a member of government in the past and who now speaks to important countries like Russia and China to set up new alliances. And this is despite all of the differences that exist on security policy, they're aiming to focus on things they have in common. And they're using all the clout that they have, their economy, their financial markets, to try to align the interests. And Germany and Europe also need to make a contribution to that process. The ability to be a vital member of the alliance is, of course, related to security policy. Our position in the transatlantic alliance is clear. And if I just mentioned John Kerry, um, and I said that Russia can be a partner. We also need to say in the same vein that whenever they violate international rules, we have to tell them off. Blurring international law borders that are not supposed to happen after the Paris Charter are unacceptable. And this is why the sanctions are justified. In Eastern Ukraine, it is just as important that Russia comes back to the Normandy format and the Minsk process and makes its own contribution to ensure that we can re-establish peace. The United States could also feel under threat deserve the solidarity of Germany and of Europe. All our allies have the right that anyone who becomes the German Chancellor they should be assured whether we take the security interests of our partners seriously. And if you don't speak up on that topic, or if you don't make any clear statements on your commitment to NATO, you do not meet the requirements and the standards that we have for the person in charge as a chancellor. And that includes the capabilities of our federal army. The 2% goal of NATO has been agreed because this is the number, this is the amount that makes us able to take military action, which is why it is so important to stand by that commitment. And that applies to everyone who runs for high level office in Germany. And this is addressed to all political parties, not just one. Now, um, climate-oriented foreign policy was mentioned before. It needs to be combined with the economic mechanisms that we have in Europe. For example, the Green Deal, an ambitious emission trading system. These need to be complemented by a climate-oriented foreign policy that makes new alliances and new collaborations possible. We've all lamented in the past that there's been the Chinese Silk Road project. But there are two sides of that. It enables trade and the exchange of commodities, but it also creates, creates uh, dependencies. Avoiding dependencies and opening up new fields and other fields for cooperation, this is a real chance for the European Union with a clean tech initiative we have the possibility to set standards for technology and innovation, thereby connecting and bringing closer other partners to our understanding of the global trade system. 
So we're not just standing idly by and complain about what's going on, but we're becoming proactive in Europe to become a part of the solution. We are part of designing tomorrow's world. And that takes me to the next issue. How can we do all that? How can we shape the future? Hydrogen technology will be very important for helping industrialized nations to achieve a cleaner environment by 2045. If people say that in Europe, that we want to preserve our chemicals industry, we want to continue to have an automotive industry or a steel industry, then the only way to make that happen is to make all of them more climate friendly. Moving to a different country is not a solution because you're still in this world and you will continue to pollute our planet. That means that the industrial system has to change. And in our trade relations, we need to also include the CO2 factor when we make our calculations. I always had the feeling that the US are very skeptical about this initiative of the European Commission president, but the climate commissioner just told me that when, for example, steel is being imported to the US, you don't just look at uh, tariffs or dumping, but also at the CO2 factor, the CO2 that is contained in all of these commodities. And if we were to be able to change the WTO in such a way that climate-related aspects are taken into account, then this can be a really important contribution to a more climate-oriented foreign policy. And now looking at um, this bouquet of topics, I think we all feel that this will be a task for NATO, for Germany, for Europe, but it will only work if we truly believe in multilateralism and commit ourselves to strong international institutions. As we've said so many times in the last 70 years, which doesn't make it any less real, we need a reform of the United Nations and we need to strengthen the United Nations. Now, of course, during the pandemic, we've realized that it would be important to have a strong World Health Organization and that the approach of saying my country first really doesn't help us to solve global, uh, global challenges. So that is why we need stronger United Nations, more multilateralism and better international trade relations. All of that is a part of the security policy for the next decade. I mentioned hydrogen technology. This technology holds the opportunity to embed security policy into the technological development. Germany will not be able to produce enough hydrogen on its own to enable it to remain an industrial country and be climate neutral at the same time. And if we use, for example, our relations to the Mediterranean state, which were once called the European neighborhood, if we can revive these relations and also help the Middle East states to move from a fossil fuel-based system to a more climate-neutral system and connect them to Europe's industrialized countries, then this is very important in geostrategic terms and political terms, and it also opens up new opportunities for economic collaboration. This European neighborhood policy once had the idea that those states who are not, strictly speaking, EU member states have the possibility of participating in the European domestic market, in scientific exchange, economic exchange, in such a way that all around the EU there will be a circle of friends, a circle of democracies, who are all committed to peace. Now, this strategy has uh, been stalled a little bit with Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia. We might still have very strong relations. We have a situation in Libya that affects all of us globally. And we see that development in Turkey, in Libya and in Syria always has a European dimension too. And this makes it very much worthwhile to do whatever we can to 
stabilize and encourage democracies, especially in the uh, in the Mediterranean countries. Now, of course, everybody talks a lot about Israel. Here, Germany's position is clear. It's part of our raison d'etat that we stand up for Israel's security and existence. And that means if somebody asks for German support to maintain that security, we must offer it. Which doesn't mean that we're going to interfere in internal affairs, but without any reservations, we always be there for Israel to support it. And together with other Europeans, we are going to make our contribution to a peace process in the Middle East. Today, it doesn't only concern the question what's happening between the Palestinians and the Israelis, the two-state solution, but the entire region. Many Arab countries now have diplomatic relations with Israel, but it's a quantum leap looking at a conflict of 50 or 60 years. And if we find an internal solution for that conflict, there is a chance to deal with all the other secondary conflicts related to this primary one. And yeah, I think European action together with the US is dearly needed and exactly the right approach. The hope such an agreement with Iran will once again happen with China, Russia, the United States and the EU will jointly make a contribution to the non-proliferation of nuclear weapons. That is a hope. It's a vision that is gaining a sense of reality because the US administration wants to uh, go along that path with us. More of that cooperation, that is the core of the foreign policy of the federal government of, or federal republic of Germany. And that is because of uh, this, that is why this epochal change that we're facing now um, requires us to look once more at those values, European integration, um, Western alliance, but also to find a new approach answer new challenges structurally, content-wise, but with the same amount of passion and engagement. Like, I think I can say it here, Konrad Adenauer did it in 1949 when he led the Federal Republic of Germany into a new direction towards the West. At the same time, it was highly disputed. Now it is a common consensus of foreign policy, and that's what we need for the future. Thank you very much, Mr. Laschet. That was a keynote with a lot of exciting aspects, and we have about half an hour to discuss. Konrad Adenauer Foundation has asked its community, has collected questions via social media and email. And I also have a few questions for you. So if you, ladies and gentlemen, would like to discuss with us on Twitter, the hashtags are CAS4 Security, K-A-S-4, the, the number four security, or hashtag Adenauer Conference. Discuss with us on social media if you like. Allow me to come back to the first point you mentioned, a National Security Council. That's something that our American partners have been urging us to do for um, quite some time. Who would who would be in there? Well, it would have to have representatives from different ministries. We know that from the Federal Security Council already, but it is limited to certain ministries only and meets um, at certain points in time only. But this needs to be part of the chancellery. It needs to be able to answer to crises, for example, such as um, Corona. Then relevant actors and stakeholders have to be brought in. The, not necessarily the lender as a uh, meeting of the ministers of state or the lender. But um, we need to have them on board. We need to have the intelligence services. And we this council needs to be able to develop strategies that can also include the parliament. And uh, the former president of the parliament knows this. The parliament cannot accept not being part of decisions of military involvement. We have a very strong executive role that, of course, will 
remain as is, but such a strategy will allow us to discuss this strategy in a broader context, and that's what the National Security Council has to develop. So the the parliament could discuss it, not change it. Is that what you're saying? Well, I would hope that the governing parties would have a majority to support the federal government, but the decisive executive questions are still part of the government, obviously. Mr. Lamad, as former president of the German parliament, would that be enough for you, the role of the parliament? Well, the role of the Bundestag of the parliament in this classic executive area is a lot more prominent than in older democracies, for example, and I do not doubt that the coming Bundestag, the coming parliament, will very carefully look at maintaining competencies and also um, ask for its participation in such a strategy. Let me come to the questions that the Adenauer Foundation has collected for us. The first question goes back to Russia. Nikita Lukva has asked this via email. Well, it's two questions, actually. And I'll start with the first bit. How do you evaluate Russian policy towards Ukraine and EU? And what, if at all, would you change in German and European politics regarding Russia? The German-European-Russia policy, I wouldn't change because it is... Well, you talked about the conflict in Ukraine. If I can talk about that first. The Franco-German initiative in Minsk, um, embedded in the Normandy format, where uh, Russia, Ukraine, France and Germany are uh, debating, of course, in coordination. That is a very good approach to leave this, this war-like tension. It hasn't been successful just yet, but a war has been avoided, a big conflict has been avoided, and it is now up to Russia to actually adhere to the commitments given in the Normandy format. That is correct. This part is correct. Russia is Europe's neighbor. And in many questions, it is also Europe's partners. I mentioned climate policy, for example, where we can do more, where especially the Americans want to start a new initiatives, including Russia. But, of course, talking about the Baltic states, for example, they can also be seen or they are seen as a threat. And Europe... Uh, has to be um, in line with its uh, member states. We have seen huge um, uh, troops in Ukraine or also towards um, the Krim. Do you see no need for change? Well, this was not something, uh, it was a bit disquieting, yes, to see the troops. Um, and the occupation of Krim is against international law and we must not recognize it. And when it comes to Eastern Ukraine, we must, to, we must make sure that troops are uh, withdrawn. That uh, How would that work? Well, this is what the Normandy format is all about. It's about building trust, trust building measures uh, pace by pace or step by step. But the basic principle of the European and the German attitude must be clear. This conflict, especially if it goes into the Ukraine from outside, must stop. The second part of Nikita Yolkva's question uh, regards Nord, Nord Stream 2. Oof. What do you say to Nord Stream 2, also in view of the new German climate targets and the political discussion in Europe? Well, Nord Stream 2 uh, is, you know, serves as example for everything. A mm, means of pressure towards Russia, uh, also as a token for uh, climate policies. And our chancellor has already answered the basic question at the Munich Security Conference. The molecule gas, you can't tell whether it is transported by land or by sea. It is a project where we, th where people think that an additional 
C pipeline is necessary. And if that is the case, then I think that's the right thing to do. But the question behind it is, what about the geostrategic implications for Ukraine once this is no longer transported by land? Will the energy security of Ukraine be threatened? Will we further depend on or will we depend more on Russia? And the federal government did this. We need to make sure and base this in international law that both the situation of Ukraine as well as dependence on Russia are not influenced by this project. So I stand for this project. I agree with the current view of the federal government. Annalena Baerbock, that's my question now. The um, candidate for the Chancellery of the Green Party very categorically talked about Nord Stream 2. She said she would have long stopped support. And in another discussion, she said the pipeline cannot start, it must not start. So in the case, there should be a black-green coalition negotiation. How big a problem would that be for a coalition talks? We'll have to see. Uh, depends on how much of the pipeline has been constructed until then. Well, I mean, it cannot happen is not a good answer because it is happening. We will have to find an answer. What about the energy supply in Germany? How can we uh, safeguard it for the future? Do we need as much gas because of climate protection? or not. But if we withdraw from everything, if we make do without coal, without nuclear power, well, we'll need gas as a bridge technology. So as far as that is concerned, I would see the energy turnaround meaning an increased need for gas in the coming years. Mrs. Baerbock seems to think that we can still stop Nord Stream Stuva, the EU guidelines in a, in a legal sense. Well, I discussed with her why would she want to stop it if sort of we, we'd have the basic um, position, I don't want to buy gas from Russia, then okay, that's something we can do. But that's not her perspective. She says gas through a pipeline in Ukraine is good, gas via Nord Stream 2 is bad. And that is is not that, that that's you know not detailed enough. If there were to be such coalition negotiations, I would be willing to discuss that with her. If she were to strategically protect Ukraine, then I will agree with her. Let us move on to the complex of China. This second question is for Nohiri de Miyanoshi via email. And again, there are two questions, maybe one of them to Mr. Lamad. It's a very big question. He wants to know, how would you describe the basic strategy towards Asia of the Christian Democrat Union? So if the Christian Democrat Union's party program that we haven't seen yet, what would they say about China? Is it partner and competitor, such as Mr. Laschet says? Well, I'm not responsible, as, as Adenauer Foundation, we're not responsible for drafting the party program, but the topic is, of course, something that we feel responsible about as well. And I would like to start with um, one remark. In China... We are working under a lot more restrictions compared to a lot of our other partner countries. And that means we don't have the same understanding of politics and democracy, uh, let alone an understanding of the importance of civil society and non-governmental organizations. So our work in China focuses mainly on observing political developments of economic and technological and social developments. And our contribution, as is that of um, other political uh, foundations, is collecting and analyzing data in order to present it to decision makers uh, in order to facilitate the decisions they have to take. The question of Asia, of course, is not a geographical one, but a political Political one as well, and a very broad one. Thankfully and sadly, we don't have uniform uh, conditions. We have very different conditions depending on where you look. And we have to do those justice in the way we perceive them and in the way we deal with them both in the work of our foundation as well as in the work of politics. The second question of Nohiri Miyoshi is directed at the Indo-Pacific space. The federal government has decided that um, the 
Bayern um, frigate ha is sent to uh, is sent out to uh, Asia, and will we see more of them? Well. <laughs> This is one part of our relation with China to talk about the Indo-Pacific and uh, to draw consequences from that. The European Union, the foreign ministers once said China is partner, competitor and rival. And that uh, is similar to what Mr. Lama just said, partner in economic relations that are very important to us, competitor because this economic competition is taking place and a rival when it comes to an image of society and human life. Work of the foundation in China. The Adenau Foundation has probably the best indicators to say how liberal and open towards civil society uh, a country is because your uh, co-workers in this country will um, know this and will feel this day in, day out. So the frigate Bayern to send it to the Indo-Pacific, I think, I think this is a correct decision. And... This is something that um, uh, finds broad consensus also beyond the current political uh, parties. The EU-China policy is also something that you mentioned. A joint declaration has not been reached when it comes to election reforms, election rate reforms in uh, Hong Kong, that's due to a veto from Hungary. The EU investment uh, agreement uh, has not been ratified, at least. So what's your perspective on this? Would, as a German chancellor, would you vote for a ratification of this agreement? Uh, our current chancellor is very much in favor of this. Yes, I think so. We also have the processes in the European Parliament where um, the relations between the EU and China are supposed to be um, further defined. We expect sanctions against certain members of the EU Parliament to be um, stopped. And if you want to be partners, you need to respect, you need to have respect. So you need to work at eye level. We are hoping for the Chinese side um, to do this. Um, but yes, I do agree with the position of our Chancellor. How could we bring the country, uh, a country to stop its veto, or to withdraw its veto? Well, that's a core problem of European foreign policy that one single country has a, has a right to veto, which makes the entire EU unable to act. And I think we need to find a way towards majority decisions also in foreign policy. Let's move on to the next complex of questions about um, the German army and the defense budget. Um, this is a question via Instagram. The first part of the question is to Mr. Lamad. It's about the capabilities of the federal army. How can we ensure, can we ensure that the army has sufficient equipment and what can be done uh, on the European level to improve the developments? But it is true that there are several answers to that expectation. We need to talk about equipment, we need to talk about political issues, but also budgetary topics. For example, we've heard about the 2% goal. And the question is whether we will draw up a budget that makes these 2% possible. I think it is extremely important also to ensure the efficient use of budgetary means that in our defense policy, we consistently look for European solutions. Parallel procurement is a true waste of limited resources. And if we look at the dimensions of the added European defense budgets, on the one hand, and the limited impact and importance that they have, then this is necessarily the conclusion to draw. And the second part of the question to you, Mr. Laschet, 
Looking at the current budgetary situation, how will you ensure that the defense budget grows? Now, that really depends on the new parliament because they have to draw up a budget and adopt it. But the fact is, by 2024, we've committed ourselves to reach the 2% goal. And I don't see any reason why we should give that up. We know this is very ambitious because we need to deal with the impact of the pandemic where we need to make sure we don't take on too many new debts. And I believe we should refrain from increasing the taxes and we are starting the new term with a structural deficit. I, I'm aware of all of that, but the security of this country and the equipment of our army must not be neglected. And they must be among the top priorities of the new government. But I mean, obviously, there um, is a lot of room for conflict if we think of the Greens as a potential coalition partner. What Annalena Baerbock raises questions about is why should we increase the defense budget? And should we really deploy our troops in our own country? Now, would it be uh, one option to not talk about the 2% goal, but just about a slightly increasing or gradually increasing defense budget? I'm not sure whether she really said it that way. But the truth is, if you have an army, it needs, needs to be equipped in such a way that it can carry out its tasks. And um, there are reasons to doubt that this is the fact now. And if we accept international missions, Somalia, Mali, Lebanon, then you could come to the conclusion that you're simply not engaging in such missions anymore. But if you want to do it, you need to enable the army and the troops to have the equipment and also fund it accordingly. I am true. I am convinced that this is something that can be negotiated. Yes, and then there was the question whether you would be willing to give up the 2% goal. I think we really need to look at the details. This percentage was chosen because it is acknowledged that countries are have different economic strengths. I mean, you can compare the cloud of Germany to, let's say, Estonia or Romania, but all of the countries should make a contribution that is proportionate to what they can do. And I think it is just fair to use the GDP as a basis for calculating that percentage. Mr. Lammert, a question to you. And coming back to Mr. Laschet's speech, he said that Germany needs to be more willing to discuss international security issues and to take action. Why has that been so difficult in the past? And how could we strengthen strategic thinking in the public debate? Would a National Security Council help? You know, looking at this very soberly, I think we are the beneficiaries and uh, victims of a true story of success. The story and history of Germany as part of a Western alliance. And for our most people in Germany, everything that we know is the situation we have today and that we take for granted. We live in peace and freedom and in agreement with all of our neighbors. And by the way, this is not self-evident. This is actually a state of exception in the history of Germany. If you speak to Estonians or Latvians or Pol Poles or Ukrainians, because of their biographies, they have a very different assessment of what um, is a risk. And this is a task of political education and the political foundations to deal with that gap in our biographies. And that means remembering political events and our history. Just like Germany, 
managed to come out of the trauma of the first half of the 20th century and has learned its lessons. We need to be careful today that we don't say goodbye to these lessons just because we haven't learned them personally and they are not part of our own personal biographies. Of course, you can also turn that around and say the relevance of health-related issues is something that has become very clear to us in recent months and hasn't really been clear before that. And if you look at recent surveys about necessary responsibilities of the EU, now many people are asking to give the EU more health responsibilities. This is something that would never have happened before COVID. And this is how the situation changes how people think. Thank you. And then there is a next question about a topic that I think is interesting for all of us, the conflict in the Middle East. And here is the question, what can Germany do to bring about peace in Israel? Well, I think here we really, really need to make a difference what happened in the last few days. This was aggression being started by Hamas. And it was important to stop that violence. Since the creation of the Israeli state in 1948, there have been so many developments, the Oslo process, Camp David, and so on and so forth. So many things could be said about that conflict. And there were reasons to criticize Israel, but what's been going on for two years now? Firing thousands of rockets on Tel Aviv and South Israel by a terrorist organization. This is not a state organization. I think in such a case, our position has to be clear, crystal clear. And fortunately, this is what happened. Now, secondly, we also have to look at the internal Palestinian conflict. We need a strong Palestinian authority, and we need to strengthen President Abbas. What the Hamas is doing is undermining Abbas. Of course, they're turning against Israel, but it also it's also a domestic conflict. And thirdly, as our federal chancellor has discussed with Netanyahu, the question is what is going to happen in the next few months? The goal has to be to continue the work on a two-state solution, to de-escalate the conflict and to develop a perspective for the region. For decades, this has been the core conflict in the world. It has also led to terrorism in many parts of the world. But we've seen that the world around Israel has changed this. Uh, what's been going on in Syria, ISIS, new dangers, and it would be very much in the interest of Israel to put an end to that conflict soon so that they can deal with all the other challenges. And what would it mean if Germany were to strengthen the Palestinian Authority? And what would be the reasons for the reasons and the arguments Germany and the US could use to convince Netanyahu? I mean, such conversations are taking place. Europe is giving um, a lot of money to the Palestinian Authority, both for its own work and for humanitarian aid. And that needs to continue so the humanitarian aid doesn't deteriorate. And then what diplomatic measures are possible, that's nothing or I could give advice or should give advice but there need to be new initiatives. Now, you like to say you are a fan of real politic in terms of foreign policy. Do you have any hopes that there will be negotiations and even successful negotiations for a two-state solutions? Well, I think we've been closer to that in the past, around the year 2000 at Camp David. Israel was willing to surrender 97% of the occupied territories. I mean, there will always be controversy about East Jerusalem, but 
Then the third, uh, the second and the third intifada started and um, everything was reversed again. And since then, there weren't really people who had enough energy and power to change this situation. We have a few minutes left. Can we come back to the topic of Europe? Would you like to see more integration? And if yes, what type of integration? Well, <laughs> one minute is really short to answer that question. On the 9th of May, the process on the future of Europe has been started by the Federal Chancellor and President Macron. This is most of all a citizens' dialogue. And this is what you need to do. You need to explain to the citizens in which areas we need more Europe and where they will benefit from it. The world, as I've described it, needs a stronger Europe. And from my point of view, this needs to lead to treaty changes. And I think the ambition of a European constitution, which we almost had once in the past, uh, would really help to bring Europe closer to the citizens. And many ideas launched by the French president are something that the German government would support. I've heard some skepticism from you on the European Recovery Fund and mutual debts. Was that right? You don't really want to see any debt mutualization? No, 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 no. That's a misunderstanding. I said from the very beginning that this will be a quantum leap. As Germans, we will only be able to recover after the pandemic if the others do as well. The domestic market is only going to work if Spain and Greece and Portugal and France as well can recover. And that's why the recovery fund is exactly the right thing to do. It happened on the initiative of Chancellor Merkel and President Macron, and now in the next six years, it needs to be filled with life so that there is real momentum. It's not just about filling uh, holes in the budget, but to trigger development. If you ask me about mutual debts, no, that's not something I would like to see. Thank you. That was a very concise answer to end with, and I think we really covered a lot of topics in the short time we had. Thank you for your questions. This was a very valuable um, discussion. And let me thank all of you, also on behalf of the Konrad Arnau Foundation. I don't have to add anything to the general thanks, really. Allow me to point out that the conference will be continued tomorrow. We'll talk about Afghanistan and transatlantic relations and the position of foreign and security policy has been strengthened and thus needs more focus and i think this has become very clear thanks to uh, the keynote speech given by armin lashit today <laughs>